All right. Um, thanks for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here in this uh, uh, beautiful uh, town uh, and in this great meeting. So, uh, yes, I'm from University of Maryland. My background is in nuclear and high energy physics. And my interest in this field is to use quantum technologies to be able to simulate um, models of interest to nuclear and high energy physicists, and in particular, lattice gauge theories. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, really uh, helps. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, so again, um, I work on uh, strong interactions and trying to use the theory of uh, strong interactions to uh, uh, study complexities uh, in, the, in the visible sector of the universe, essentially matter. Um, so if you think about it, even the simplest hadron, say a single proton or a neutron, is a very complex object that is seen in this very nice artistic picture of a proton. Um, so we would like to describe not only the protons and neutrons, but everything else that is built from them, atomic nuclei, all the way to the macroscopic objects that you see out there, is starting from the standard model of particle physics. In this particular picture, trying to understand the dynamics of quarks and gluons that uh, builds this interesting complexity. So can we simulate matter as starting from these fundamental interactions? That's the question. The answer is yes, we can, but even simulating a single proton itself is a very hard problem because we are dealing with an infinite many-body quantum mechanical system in principle, right? So both quantum mechanics and relativity are in play once we try to perform these simulations, and we have to account for both effects at the same time, and that's where the complexity comes in. So again, I'm a lattice gauge theorist, and there is this um, extensive program on lattice gauge theory and lattice QCD in particular that has been built over many decades uh, with an heroic effort in theory, algorithm, and computation over the years that has enabled a lot of important um, studies and predictions for, uh, for the matter um, and for problems of interest in high energy physics, in nuclear and hadronic physics as well. So, I'm going to be selfish and just show you one single example of the kind of things that we've been able to achieve as a community in this endeavor of uh, sort of trying to describe nature starting from a standard model interactions. So you can imagine that even the rate of nuclear reactions of importance um, in nuclear and hadronic physics, for example, the, the rate of the proton-proton fusion that um, power is the sun, if you want to start to predict this rate from the quark and gluon dynamics, that's a very complicated problem. But fortunately, we're really making the steps in being able to make such predictions from the standard model. So this is an example of a paper from a couple of years back from the collaboration that I'm part of, nuclear physics from lattice QCD collaborations or NPL QCD collaborations where we show that in principle we have access to um, these kind of um, processes as well. And many, many more examples that I'm just not going to cover in this talk, but we have to keep in mind that using classical computations, we've really made a lot of progress in accessing um, inaccessible physics even a few, few years back. Uh, using the method of lattice QCD. And in particular, this is a program that is supporting multi-billion dollar experimental program in this field, not only for the kind of problems that I showed you about nuclear reactions, but also in terms of hadron structure, nuclear structure and astrophysics, fundamental symmetries and searches for new physics in high energy physics experiment, as well as hadronic spectroscopy and searches for various different um, excitations and resonances in, in the QCD spectrum. Uh, so this is a very important program that is really supporting, uh, on the theoretical side, um, um, this, this big field, right? But does this mean that we are all set? Well, fortunately not, right? Although we're making progress with many important problems, 
there are still intractable computational problems for us. And in particular, you can start to enumerate a number of important topics in nuclear and high energy physics where we need to go beyond classical computations. And these are usually the kind of problems that require uh, computations that, that um, um, require sort of exponential amount of resources to be put into the problem to, for example, combat sign problems or signal to noise problems. Because the way that we do these calculations is kind of a statistical in nature. We do Monte Carlo sampling. And that's why we run into these problems. Finite density systems, real time dynamics, these are the problems that we've really seen limited progress in recent years using Lattice QCD, and we're really hoping to uh, take advantage of new technologies to go about them. So these are the kind of physics that, for example, you can attack collider phenomenology, matter in and out of equilibrium, neutrino physics and neutrino astrophysics, early universe and cosmology questions, as well as even quantum gravity. So there are many, many complex questions within these topics where you can imagine, for example, using quantum simulation to attack. Um, and now you, now you can think about if you're using quantum simulation, what is that sort of ecosystem and scientific framework that has to de evolve around these kind of problems to enable us to attack them? And if you're interested in learning about that uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, some, some colleagues in the community, we have put, put out this uh, white paper. It's a bit it's a bit of a long white paper for the US particle physics planning process or SNOMAS. Uh, you can take a look and see what are the kind of ideas that we're thinking about um, uh, for, for the community in the next 10 years really uh, to follow to get us on track with being able to take advantage of quantum technologies and in particular quantum simulation to make advancements in these kind of problems. So this is kind of the motivation for us. But now I'm going to let's go back to this picture and show you um, a little bit of more, um, more of a story about how do we go about these underlying simulations. Because it turned out that for all these different uh, problems that we have identified, the underlying simulations that we're thinking about are relying on either simulating nature starting from quantum field theory descriptions or if there are separation of the scales and various different properties, we can also think about effective field theory descriptions of nature. In both of these cases, we're really interested in simulating the fields. And you learned quite a great deal about this from Natalie's talk yesterday. So I'm going to kind of follow up on that from a more practical point of view now. Okay. So simulating quantum field theories, how different is it for simulating something like quantum chemistry problems? Because there's been a great deal of progress in quantum chemistry simulations and algorithms in the past few years, making a case for quantum simulation. Um, can we just use those advancements in simulating quantum field theories as well? The answer is yes and no, right? Yes, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, a lot of general frameworks we can take advantage of. But on the other hand, we're dealing with fundamentally different physics problems. And in particular, among the differences, you can think about simulating the standard model quantum fields, and in particular, gauge theories, as simulating bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom that are dynamical and coupled. Not only they show global symmetries, but they also exhibit local symmetries. It is very important to be um, simulated properly. We are dealing with relativistic uh, systems. So despite non-relativistic systems, we don't have a conserved quantum number. And as a result, we can deal with even non-trivial vacua, right, in, in a strongly interacting quantum field theories, in particular, like quantum chromodynamics or QCD, we really need to get uh, the dynamics of even the, the vacuum or no particle state uh, uh, precisely to be able to make accurate predictions. There are also some uh, recent effort in putting quantum field theory simulations in the language of quantum chemistry and narrativistic quantum mechanics, and there are ideas about that, so you can check out some of these references. This is a very active field at the moment. 
so in general, um, simulating quantum field theories using quantum technologies is going to be a very um, um, extensive and multi-pronged program. We need theory developments. We need to build the foundations, and I'll give you a few examples of what I mean by that. We also need to do algorithmic developments, and at the same time, we need to perform uh, or engage in a co-design process. We need to implement and benchmark our proposals, but also hopefully try to um, impact the course of the design of the quantum computers and quantum simulators that would be of more use or more suitable for the kind of simulations that we have in mind. And I try to give a few examples in given context to motivate why I think that these multiple pranks are important uh, to make progress in this field. Okay, so what do I mean by theory developments? So we're talking about simulating a standard model, so these are gauge theories, and in particular, we have abelian and non-abelian gauge theories. We're talking about quantum simulation, so Hamiltonian simulation is the natural language here. Despite the conventional lattice QCD program that uses Lagrangian and path integral formulation, we have to now think about Hamiltonians and Hilbert spaces and wave functions. This is something that is, again, new to our community. There's been progress on that frontier in the beginning of the development of our field, but because sort of we all um, learned that we can do very efficient Monte Carlo using path integral formulations, sort of that dominated the development. We have to go back to Hamiltonian formulation now that we're using a different simulation strategy using quantum computers. So there are different formulations of the Hamiltonian because obviously you can have different representations of your Hilbert space, and depending on those representation or basis of states, you have a different representation for your Hamiltonian. In the end of the day, they're supposed to describe the same physics in the continuum limit, but if you want to, for example, have a lattice formulation, you can have many different choices, for example. Right. So let me talk about the Colgate and Susskind Hamiltonian that was actually written down at the same time that Ken Wilson uh, wrote down sort of the Lagrangian formulation of lattice gauge theories uh, to show that these are actually equivalent formulations. In any case, the Hamiltonian looks simple, and in general, for abelian or non-abelian gauge theories uh, with matter, you can have or expect to have these four different terms. You can have interactions that involve uh, fermions and bosons, and these are what we call link interactions or um, uh, hopping terms. So you can imagine that the fermions would hop, but the, this hopping is assisted with a gauge boson, these gauge links that are sitting in between. So that's one difference compared to just the fermionic theory. What else do we have in the theory? We have an energy that is stored in the electric field. Again, this is uh, a term that is defined on the link, okay? And this is nothing but the E square term that we are all familiar with. If you're dealing with a non-Abelian gauge theory, this would be extended to non-Abelian electric fields, okay? We also have the matter interactions. This is what is called a staggered formulation that was developed by Colgate and Susskind which means that you have a staggered mass term, but besides that, you just have a mass associated with your fermions sitting at uh, even or odd sites. What else we have? If you're in higher than one dimensions, in, for example, this two-dimensional special plane, you can imagine to have the magnetic type interactions as well. Again, in electromagnetism, you expect in B squared or magnetic field squared term. This is nothing but that term in the continuum limit, if you think about QED, for example. So these are the interactions that are defined as the trace of this plaquet term. And they are usually more complex to think about, at least in this formulation, where I think about um, sort of an electric field basis for representing my Hamiltonian. In any case, in summary, um, the Kogan and Susskind Hamiltonian for a variety of theories and including QCD that we are all interested in is going to have these four different terms. Okay, so um, what are some, what are the uh, features of, of this theory? 
The first thing that you notice is that because you're dealing with the gauge bosons, this is an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So we have to put some truncation on this Hilbert space. So again, that's where that uh, concept of different representations and basis states comes in, because depending on how you decide to represent your Hilbert space, putting it the truncation on the high excitation at Hilbert space uh, would be kind of a different truncation as if you had represented your Hamiltonian differently. The question is that how can you recover the exact theory towards the continuum limit with the least amount of resources? So there's been quite a lot of work, both theoretically and, for example, analytically in, in some of these papers to show that, at least for some of these theories that we have looked at, uh, the um, approach to the exact theory seems to be exponential for low energy observables and for uh, sort of a small time um, observables, which is good. Um, but we need more research on that frontier, right? We need to understand this kind of systematic that is associated with truncating the Hilbert space of bosonic field theories. So that's one uh, aspect of this when it comes to theory developments. What else do we notice from this Hamiltonian is, um, well, this is a Hamiltonian that describes um, complete Hilbert space. But as we know from experiment and from nature, only a given sector of this, Hamil this Hilbert space that you can write down for this Hamiltonian is physical. The reason being is exactly the gauge symmetries. There is an operator that I call Gauss's law operator that commutes with your Hamiltonian. It's locally defined. And because of this relation, there are various different disjoint sector of your Hilbert space. And only one of them is physical. And in particular, for, for example, something like this non-Abelian gauge theory, SU2 or SU3, um, you can imagine that that's corresponding to the zero non-Abelian charge. In the case of QED or electromagnetism, you know this very well. Right, the flux of the electric field has to be balanced by the matter charge that is sitting within, in, within the volume. Now you can imagine there is a non-Abelian generalization of that concept also on the lattice. Okay, so that's, that's all that. So pictorially, what we are talking about is that we have a very vast Hilbert space, but we're just interested in the physics that happens in a particular sector of it. So you, if you start your simulation in the physical sector and you do Hamiltonian evolution, you're going to remain in that sector. But how if you do not do your simulations in a perfect manner? You have algorithmic or experimental error. You're going to leak out of this physical Hilbert space, and then you're going to explore a vast Hilbert space. And there, is, there, there might be a problem there, right? So you might ask, what's the relative size of this sector compared to the rest of the Hilbert space. This sector itself is exponentially large in the size of the system, in the degrees of freedom. So this is still pretty large. But it is a small by orders of magnitude, even for a small lattice and a small truncation of the gauge links. As you can see from so, so this plot where we compare the physical and the full Hilbert space size, for a simple SU2 gauge theory in one plus one dimensions. You can think about hundreds of orders of magnitude difference in the size. So you don't really want to waste your quantum resources in simulating the full Hilbert space. You want to really sort of limit yourself to the physical sector. How can you do that? So there are various different ideas about symmetry protection, and they can apply to this context too because we're talking about sort of a local symmetry protection, right? So let me tell you about one of these ideas. So this is the idea that if you want to do Hamiltonian simulation using the Trotter-Suzuki formula, you break down um, this Hamiltonian to various different terms. Depending on first order or second order Trotter formula, you have different representation for these unitaries. But um, in general, this process can break symmetries. At including Gauss's law and gauge symmetries, right? So how can you protect it? And there's this idea in, in this, this reference where they propose that in between your Trotter step, you introduce these random unitaries, right? 
So you have CMC dagger. These are unitaries that are a generator of the symmetry. They commute with the Hamiltonian. Okay, but if you actually insert these unitaries with random angles in between your trotter steps, and you do many trotter steps, what would happen is that these unitary operations are going to just like pass through this. If the error that is occurring is within the physical sector of your theory, because they commute with them and there is no difference right, in the result. But if there are errors that are occurring that would take you out of the physical subspace, you're, uh, you can get a different rotation in a sense. right? And because you're inserting random unitaries here, every time you're kind of rotating your unitary for those unphysical errors in a, in a given direction, as a function of time, you can average them out to something very small. So that's really sort of behind the, the idea. In fact, you can apply it to a simple lattice gauge theory, so just the foresight Schwinger model that has abelian gauge constraints. And in theory, what you see that, yes, you can actually suppress the leakage to the unphysical sector of the theory by many orders of magnitude by using this process, which is great. We try to test this in experiments and see whether it works as well. And unfortunately, it doesn't. And this is important because that tells us something important about the nature of the error. Of course, you can say that there are errors that are associated with the trotter, but you can do the same thing with the errors that are in the experiment. But if those errors are not correlated in time and coherent, you're not going to take advantage of this process. In particular, if you have time decorrelated and incoherent errors, this process is not that helpful. And this is what we actually see. That at the for the time being, doing things like post-selection based on the symmetries would be more efficient than doing sort of more complicated procedures like this that would just get rid of a certain type of error that seems to not be dominant in the current NISC era simulations. Okay, so that's one lesson. What else you can do? Given that now in experiment or in algorithm we have errors and we don't have very good error mitigation techniques at the moment to suppress those unphysical transitions. Well, one idea is that you start from a formulation, sort of, again, those theory foundations are important. You start from a theoretical formulation that solves all these non-abelian constraints, for example. So if you start from degrees of freedom in operators that only excite the physical states in the Hamiltonian, in the Hilbert space, then um, this is a much more beneficial approach than you just allow all those unphysical transitions to be in the formulation, right? So this is as far as I want to say about this formulation, which is called loop string and hadrons, those physical excitations that was developed by um, 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 a po a two postdocs in, in my group, and they're still working on extending this to the case of QCD and so on. This is very promising, because that would tell you that you just avoid that unphysical Hilbert space, or at least most of it, from the beginning, by solving those non-abelian Gauss's laws a priori, before even going into simulating them in, in, in the computer. Okay? It turned out that it is actually advantages to do that. From an algorithmic point of view, we have looked at the cost of different formulation of these SU2 non-abelian gauge theories, and we actually see that it is indeed true that with a formulation that only has physical degrees of freedom, you can reduce the cost by many orders of magnitude. All right, so in the last few minutes, let me quickly go over some examples and what I mean by algorithmic and implementation uh, frontier for this quantum simulation. I want to focus on the case of trapped ions, not because we saw this very nice introduction in the, in the first talk by, by Christian on the trapped ions, but also because I've been also interested in the trapped ion technology and working with a number of trapped ion collaborators at the University of Maryland to see what we can do with these systems for lattice gauge theories. So as we saw from the first talk, we have trapped ion systems that can work in an analog way. They can simulate an Ising-type interactions of the type of XX plus a magnetic field. 
You can also tune um, these kind of interactions and introduce more lasers and optimiza optimizations to be able to do something like Heisenberg type interactions, as we've, we've shown in these papers, and there have been other proposals for this. So not only you have XX, but also XX, YY, and ZZ type interactions, which would be very useful. Um, you can also try to introduce more higher body interactions, for example, something like plus, sigma plus, sigma plus, sigma plus, or even higher body interactions in a digital sense. So again, these are, at the moment, theoretical proposals, and no experiment has been performed to show the, the efficiency of these proposals, but um, let's just have this out there. As we learned, we can also do digital simulations with trapped iron systems, meaning that you can just take your Hamiltonian and then separate it to various different terms, and for example, use the Trotter-Suzuki expansion to then and divide this simulation into various different steps. And then each of these steps hopefully would be easy enough to represent in terms of single and two body qubit gates. And in this case, these are just single and two body uh, gates, Molmer Sorensen gates that we learned about. Another strategy could be an analog digital approach, meaning that, for example, in a trapped iron system, you also have phonons. So instead of just thinking about the phonons as virtual degrees of freedom to uh, use them to make entanglements between your ions, you can think about them as dynamical degrees of freedom as well. So in that context, you can also introduce gates that are of the type of a spin phonon interactions or even phonon phonon interactions. And I'm skipping a lot of details here, but of course you can consult the papers or just talk to me afterwards. Meaning that you still have a digital scheme, but you're introducing more gates um, that are intrinsic to your system, so why not using them if you need to? So a few examples of using this strategy. Well, you can, um, we can look at an abelian gauge theories in one dimension. So again, the terms are as before. Uh, the matter field interacting via these gauge links, the electric field, the mass term, and there is no hop, there is no plaquette term or magnetic term in this l lower dimensions. But you can also map it to a spin problem, which is of the type of a Heisenberg interactions with long range ZZ type interactions. You can do that in one dimension because you can solve this Abelian Gauss's law in this case. You can also have a quantum link description of the same model where you have sort of three spin interactions in the picture. So you see there are various different formulations of the same model. You should ask yourself which one is more efficient from the algorithmic point of view and then from implementation point of view. And that's the example that I'm going to tell you in the, in the last two minutes. So again, these are the strategies, digital, analog, digital, and analog. How can we simulate something like lattice schwinger model, this abelian gauge theory, using each of these approaches? Well, as I said, you can have fully a spin formulation of the same model, but it's long-range Heisenberg-type interactions, including also nearest neighbor. And as I said, in this paper, we introduced ways of inducing Heisenberg-type interactions. It's a bit complicated because this requires three sets of counter-propagating uh, ions, but we have a, um, a brave experimental colleague is trying to build this system at the moment at the Rice University. And then you can do a classical optimization that is not hard to scale, and then get all the laser parameters that are necessary to get your nearest neighbor or Coulomb-like long-range interactions in this model. What else you can do? You can go to the quantum link formulation, which is a three spin interactions, and then use the strategy that I told you about using now two sets of counter-propagating lasers to be able to, in theory at least, simulate this model. And this is some of the numerics that we've done to see that this is really um, uh, doable in practice. You can do the digital formulation of the spin representation. And in this case, you just have one set of lasers just doing your usual molmer sorensen type gates that is uh, natural, and this is indeed a simple circuit that looks like this. Um, the very first paper that came out on this uh, simulation from, from Innsbruck Group, and, and um, uh, Christian knows, of course, about this. This is simulating the lattice Schwinger model, a foresight theory using the trapped iron systems. 
in this sort of digital sense. There's been more work by Natalie and collaborators and doing sort of the same model on the IBM machine. And we have also extended this to kind of longer simulation times and larger systems to see kind of what's, what are the limits at the moment. And this is kind of sort of the state of the art at the moment for simulating these theories. There's a lot more going on, even for non abelli engaged theories. You can ask Jingli or, or Natalie and others about the progress in implementing those non abelli theories as well. You can do the digital simulation, but in the formulation that has the bosonic degrees of freedom. Meaning that you have to take this gauge boson and then also encode it into a number of qubits. And you need a lot more qubits as a result, right? And that means that your quantum circuit is also going to be a lot more complicated, OK? And this is from a paper that was done by Alex Shaw and collaborators a couple of years back. And they show that if you want to take the, quant the continuum limit of this theory and do a very good calculations with high accuracy, you need of the orders of hundreds of thousands to millions of entangling gates to reach that. So this is sort of the order of magnitude of resources we're talking about even for a simple theory. Let me skip this about the scaling arguments and go now to the analog digital example where you can take the, this complicated circuit that I had before and say, all right, how if I uh, encode bosonic degrees of freedom into the phonon degrees of freedom of the ion trap, right? So now the picture is something like this. You have the fermions represented by the ions, but then you have the gauge links uh, sort of the, the bosonic degrees of freedom represented by one set of um, modes, in this case, the local modes, fermionic uh, bosonic modes in the system. What you can see is that the circuit is now much more simple because you can replace a lot of electric field interactions and matter boson interactions with these kind of more, more simpler gates, some of which are actually easy. So these are just the sideband transitions, nothing more than that. These might be a bit more challenging in practice, uh, the standing wave gates. And then you can really get orders of magnitude difference in terms of the scaling. You might ask, is it possible to do the phonon control experimentally? I guess you should ask Christian. My collaborators believe that this is possible because they did a paper a few years back of looking at the phonon dynamics and controlling and uh, measuring them in, in the end. So this is some of the results that you can check out. At least for a small systems, that seems possible, but we'll see what future holds. Uh, this is the summary and outlook, and I just skipped this because I want to kind of give this teaser about this program that we're going to have in, in Munich next year on quantum computing methods for high energy physics. This is going to involve not only quantum simulation, but also quantum machine learning and tensor network methods for high energy physics. It's going to be a one month program. If any of you are interested, I mean, most of you are local, so you're um, more than welcome to join the discussion, but make sure to register before the deadline is over. Many thanks to a lot of my collaborators. Many of them are very young and motivated researchers from many different areas. This is a very multidisciplinary research. I've been really enjoying talking to uh, people from, from the quantum information science community. So with that, thank you very much. Sorry for going over time. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for laying out uh, this grand program of um, simulating lattice gauge theories. Are there um, urgent questions from the audience? Or the online audience? Actually, I, I do have sort of a more principled question. In between okay. Here, I mean, because in some sense, I mean, sort of with, with w what you're studying in the end is, is more quantum matter Hamiltonians, I mean, which live on, on a lattice. And of course, I mean, these Hamiltonians, I mean, they break a lot of the continuum symmetries, I mean, like Lorentz invariants. And in, in high energy physics, I guess, I mean, you learn, I mean, uh, you, you, should, you should then at least argue I mean, why these things are renormalizable I mean, and study the beta function. Is there any way, I mean, any hope uh, 
to approach beta functions in Ubuntu's quantum simulations? Uh, yes, very good question. So this concerns uh, the fact that if you are really interested in a continuum physics that has all the symmetries, you have to be able to recover them, and you have to be able to recover them uh, efficiently, meaning that you have to actually be in the same universality class to start with to get to the continuum uh, limits of the theory that you're interested in studying. And for, I would say, some of the formulation, I didn't talk about sort of this, this variety of formulations that are out there that are proposing that you can actually get the continuum limit, even without the lattice formulation. You can have just finite dimensional sort of a spin type, uh, a spin physics type <laughs> um, description of these gauge theories, and the claim is that in certain limits, you can uh, recover the continuum physics. I would say, though, that um, the way to sort of study the continuum limit of these theories is no different in terms of Hamiltonian and Lagrangian formulation. This is your, your lattice formulation. You can even use the Monte Carlo techniques, apply to those formulations to be able to see whether you recover the continuum technique, right? So that's sort of the starting point, whether in terms of Lagrangian or Hamiltonian. Um, with quantum simulation, yes, indeed, you can actually get the beta functions because you can get the observables in the same way that you get the observables in Monte Carlo simulations and sort of take the continuum limit. You can just take the energies or the expectation values and compute them in principle, right, in quantum simulations, and then sort of uh, recover those or make those kind of extrapolations. So it's no different. Okay. Thanks. Are there more questions? Uh, if this is not the case. Uh, let us thank our speaker again. Thank you. So